Good morning, everyone. Very warm welcome to our Sunday service again. Thank you for joining us today. Appreciate having you online for our call today. We have been speaking over the past few weeks on building our lives on the rock, and there were some important foundations were laid in those teachings. So I do encourage people, if you have the opportunity, to go through some of them, because you will be blessed. And we're building on that foundation, because today we're moving on to a new series called Living a Lifestyle of Worship. And so we're going to begin that today. If you have your Bibles available, that would be great. As normal, we'll be covering a number of scriptures today so you can follow along with that. I'm just going to open us in prayer before we start for today. Holy Spirit, we just thank you that you're here with us. I thank you that you're in every home that's watching this and that indeed will watch this, Lord, that you will speak into the hearts and lives of everyone, Lord, and that we can transition into a place of deeper worship of you, Lord, that our lives can truly demonstrate our love for you, Lord. We just thank you and praise you for this time in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the first scripture we'll be looking at today is Romans 12, verse 1. If you have your Bibles available, Romans 12, verse 1. We're looking at living a lifestyle of worship. And worship is much bigger than many of us have realized because it's beyond just the singular act of worship, which we will look at that as well. The act of worship and the lifestyle of worship. We're going to look at that today, but it's very important that we see the bigger picture of what worship is and how it's a lifestyle and how it's how we walk with God as well. So this is an important scripture when we are looking at that. So Romans 12 verse 1. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. The first part there is important when we talk about in view of God's mercy. So when we think about what Christ did for us, when we think of who God is, this is why our lives begin to worship God. This is why we begin to follow his ways. So it's important that part there as well. And our bodies as a living sacrifice. So this is everything. This is who we are, our very bodies, holy and pleasing to God, pleasing in the aspect of being obedient to his ways, holy in the way that we walk in our lives. And this is your true and proper worship. And so when we look at worship, there's an act of worship. And so we're going to differentiate and look at the difference between a singular act of worship and a lifestyle of worship, because this is something that sometimes can be confused by people and it's important that we look at the bigger picture here of what is a lifestyle of worship because that's what God requires and desires from us a lifestyle of worship so let's look at an act of worship first an act of worship is like a single act or demonstration of our love for God for example when we sing Psalm 69 verse 30 Psalm 69 verse 30 I will praise the name of God with a song and magnify him with thanksgiving. So the scripture tells us here that we can praise God and magnify him with a song. And so when we, we do something like that, when we're magnifying God with a song or we're praising God, that is a singular act of worship. There's a contrast to a lifestyle of worship. A lifestyle of worship is everything we do demonstrates our love and our commitment to God. And we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, a great scripture on this, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. You see, we see the difference here. Whether we eat or drink, everything that we do is to bring glory to God. That's the difference between an act of worship and a lifestyle of worship, because Many times it's confused and we think that, well, when we worship God at church or we, we put in a worship CD, that singular act, that's worship. That alone is not worship. In the eyes of God, that's like an act of worship. And that's very powerful. And over the next few weeks, we will look at the act of worship. There's some very, very powerful acts of worship, spiritual warfare and things that you can do regarding worship that are very powerful and very important. But those are an act of worship. What we're looking at is the lifestyle of worship. 
And if more believers grasped the importance of a lifestyle of worship, the church would not be the way it is today because a lifestyle of worship is when everything we do demonstrates our love and our devotion to God. And when more of us are doing that, we can have a much bigger impact in the world when more of us are realizing that it's our entire lives, everything we do, as the scripture says, the basics, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we're doing all for the glory of God, conscious of the glory of God. We mentioned it the other week when we talk about the what would Jesus do bracelets. And this is when we're going to a deeper aspect of that, when it's everything that we do should be glorifying God. We should be asking ourselves, is this glorifying God? And that can help us walk in the path of holiness and obedience when we are literally asking ourselves, is this the right thing to do? Will this bring glory to God? If we ask that question a bit more, we can make better decisions. So let's look at a more broader definition of worship then so that we have this clear because we want to lay this foundation because there's some deeper things we're going to go into over the next few weeks but we want to lay the foundation of worship in the first place and then we can begin to build on that so what is worship and worship as we know it's not limited to people worshiping the true god that we worship which is the lord jesus christ and god himself other people other religions worship other things as well so the definition of worship is broad and when we look at this here acknowledgement of the greatness and worthiness of the object of your worship now that's a broader sense because that brings into context what other people may follow other people may believe also but when we put it in our context as believers as christians acknowledgement of the greatness and the worthiness of god this is what we're doing when we're worshiping god we're acknowledging who he is his greatness his worthiness it is our allegiance to him our commitment to obey his commands it's our devotion, it's our agreement with him. It's a thankful acknowledgement of what he's done for us. As the scripture tells us, we love God because he first loved us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. As it, we just read there in Romans 12 verse 1, in view of God's mercy. When we think about what God has done for us, that should bring the gratitude, the thankfulness, that appreciation towards God for what he's done. Sent his son to pay the price for our sins, that we don't have to suffer for eternity, that we can have hope in this life even before we talk about eternity. And when we think about God's mercy and what he's done for us, that should bring a gratitude in our hearts. So a more complete and full definition of worship could look like this. Living a life that demonstrates our commitment through obedience and the way that we walk, showing gratitude, love and devotion to an awesome God who proved his love for us through Jesus Christ. As we read in the scripture, it says, God demonstrated his love for us by sending Jesus. Because the love aspect of love and worship, they're intertwined and they're connected as we're just going to look at John 14, 23 in a moment. But those are all intertwined together because it says that God demonstrated, proved, showed, illustrated his love for us by sending Jesus. And as we're going to look at now, there's an important biblical principle here regarding if we say we love God, we worship him, we're devoted to him, we honor him, that has to equate to a demonstration of that love through our life, through obedience, through the way that we live our lives. The two of them go hand in hand. And Jesus himself said, you say that you love me, but you do not obey my commands. You say that you follow me, but if you do, you will obey my commands. If you do not follow my ways, you do not truly love me. Is Jesus himself that said that. So let's look at this, John 14, verse 23. Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will keep and obey my commandments and my words. My Father will love him and will come to him and make a home with him. So this is what we're talking about here. Jesus himself says, If you love me, if you're truly devoted, you worship me, you honor me, if you do, you will obey my commands, you will follow my ways, you will follow my words, we will follow the scripture. So the Lord himself equates the two of them together, that if we truly love him, truly worship him and follow his ways, we will obey his commands. Our lives will demonstrate our love for God. Just as God did that by sending his son, he didn't just say, I love you, my creation. He demonstrated, he showed it by sending his son our lives, if we say, I love you, God, I worship you, I follow you, we must demonstrate that by the way we live our lives. And it's vital that we do that. What we're going to do here, we're going to look at the origin of worship. 
This is slightly deeper, but I believe it's important that we understand and see where the origin of worship and sin came from originally, because sin did not come from the Garden of Eden. Yes, there was a knowledge, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil that Adam and Eve ate from, but that's not where sin began. Because if we look at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that tells us that there was already evil in the world for Adam and Eve to partake of. So we're going to go back to the beginning, even before the beginning, beginning of Adam and Eve, because we want to look at the origin of worship and what the whole dynamics of worship and music and, and our lives and obedience to God. We want to look at this because, again, when we look at the origins and the things in the beginning, it helps us connect with what's happening in our lives and in the world today. So let's just go a little bit deeper here today. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you have cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 give us powerful insights into the origin of Lucifer, the origin of the devil, what happened in the beginning between him and God before Adam and Eve were even on the earth. That's where the evil that was in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that's where it comes from. It comes from what you're going to hear today. And it's important because the, 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 the devil was a praise angel over God. He was a worship angel. He was the choir master, for lack of a better term. He was the choir master in heaven, even before we were created, even before Adam and Eve came on the scene. He was a choir master in heaven. And as the scripture says here, how you are fallen. The dynamics of what was happening in heaven was Lucifer was over God as the praise angel he was the one the bible says he was a covering angel so it's like you know how we have these angels with wings that cover over the ark of the covenant and that type of thing he was a covering angel that was praising god he was the highest ranking angel there in heaven in the beginning and the scripture if you read these things in isaiah 14 and ezekiel 28 we don't have time to go through all that today because that's not our focus we're not going to focus on the enemy but it's just important that we understand this he was the praise angel over God. He conducted all the worship, all of creation at that point was worshiping God. And there was Lucifer between the two of them, the choir master, orchestrating the worship and praise in heaven. The Bible tells us what began to happen was pride rose up in his heart. He looked at the glory of God. He looked at all of creation worshiping God. He wanted that. He desired that. The Bible says he wanted to take the place of God incredible how can you think that you can take the place of God but his pride was such that he thought he could actually do that and as the Bible tells us he took a third of the angels deceived them as well into thinking that they could somehow overthrow God it's an incredible thing when you think about it but this is what happened in the beginning at that point he was a praise angel over God he saw the glory of God his creation he saw all of creation all these angels all these beings praising God and he desired that he wanted to be praised he wanted people to lift him up he wanted to take the place of God he wanted to be worshipped and see this is where the origin of worship comes from and this is where worship has been manipulated so much and it's the enemy that manipulates worship music sound all these things come from what happened in the beginning the Bible actually says that the the, the enemy had pipes and organs musical instruments part of his body part of his actual spiritual body was musical instruments that played sound to god like i said we can look at those scriptures and you, you'll get more of a background and in the book of revelation also talks about these things and what happened in the war in heaven between the angels and all that kind of thing so there's a lot out there that you can get into but say we're not focusing on that we just want to look at this because it's important that we know the origins of these things because since the beginning there has been a battle over our worship. That's where it came from. But what the enemy knew, and this is when his bad plan came in and unfortunately succeeded. He knew that if he could get Adam and Eve to take the fruit from the tree, that he could separate them from God. Because in the beginning, as we know, Adam and Eve walked with God, perfect harmony. They worshipped him, perfect obedience. There was no issues or problem between them. But... The enemy knew, well, if I can get them to take from that tree, I can get the same poison, that same sin and evil and wickedness into their bodies, into their being that he had. And he knew once he put that inside the body of Adam and Eve, he knew 
if I can get sin into them, I will separate their worship from God. I will separate them from God and I will ruin, contaminate God's creation for good. And as we know, unfortunately, he succeeded. He got Adam and Eve to take the fruit that transferred the knowledge of evil that was in that tree into Adam and Eve, into the sin nature that you see today. Because he knew he wanted to separate man from God. And he knew if he could get that into their bodies, into their beings, he could do that and he could stop the worship. How did he know that would work? Because that's exactly what had just happened to him prior to that. We don't know how many years it was before that happened. But in heaven, he knew, well, he sinned, he rose up in pride, he was cast to the earth, he was cast out of heaven, rejected by God because of his rebellion and all the third of the angels. All the demons that we see in the world today, they were cast out of heaven because of the rebellion, separated from God, could no longer worship God, no longer had a relationship with God. And the devil's plan, and he knew, he thought, if I can get Adam and Eve to eat from that tree of evil, get the same poison that kicked me out of heaven, I can separate man from God. And as we know, he succeeded in that plan. He managed to separate God from man by that sin. Adam and Eve separated themselves. And what we need to realize as well, when we talk about sound and worship and the origins, this is why music is so important in our lives as believers. Music is so, so important. So we're touching on a little bit on the act of worship at the moment now, rather than the lifestyle of worship, because the, the enemy knows how to manipulate sound, music, worship. He knows how to do that. And so that's why you'll see in the world today the power and the impact of music and sound because it is a pure version that comes from God. But because the enemy understands it right from the beginning, manipulates sound, he knows how to manipulate it in the earth. Let me give some practical examples. Over the years, working with young people, many times young people have come to me and they've told me openly, said Thomas, when I begin to listen to this type of music, I get very rebellious, I get angry, I start to have arguments with my, with my parents, I start to feel depressed, I start to feel all kinds of things. What's going on there? What we need to recognise is that because the enemy understands music, sound, worship, the impact of these things, like we know when we begin to worship or we begin to listen to music, you can get into tears in a moment. You can be very sad, you can be very happy, you can be very angry. Music can change your mood, the, the way that you're feeling, just with one song, a few lyrics of a song, we've all experienced it. You can be in tears in a moment. What is that? That's the power of an act of worship. That's the power of worship, the power of sound. It's so powerful. But like with everything, it can be used for the negative. It can be used for the evil. It can be used for the bad. And the devil is he is proficient, as you can imagine, since he knew it from the beginning. He's an expert at manipulating sound and music for his demonic purposes. And that's why young people, not just young people, many people have experienced this, that they will listen to the wrong type of music and suddenly the atmosphere can change in their home. And I've heard people, they've given me these testimonies and they'll begin to listen to certain types of music and all of a sudden they're full of fear. There's a negativity, the atmosphere shifts into something very strange in their home. And that's why I encourage believers and it really is a very important practical thing that as part of our walks with God, to have worship and Christian music as part of it. I'm not one who says never listen to secular music. I, I will never say that because there's some secular music that is not absolute demonic or evil. So, so I would never turn around and say to people, never listen to secular music. No, I wouldn't say that. I know there's some people that think that, but not all secular music is bad. A lot of secular music has demonic influences of the enemy who, that he will use to bring young people, I mean, we've heard of young people, they, they, they listen to all types of music, all of a sudden there's violence, there's rage, there's rebellion. Again, not only young people, I'm only giving that example because that's one of the ones I've experienced the most. But anyone can be influenced by these things. That's why it's vital in a practical sense as believers that we have worship, that we have Christian music as part of what you listen to. Because you can be having the worst day you can imagine. You put on a worship CD, and begin to praise God and you watch everything just begin to, to disappear. You watch the presence of God fill your home, fill the atmosphere of your home. All of a sudden you're full of joy. You're praising God by just that act of worship. Putting that song on, your mind is fixed on the Lord. It's very powerful, it's very important and I really encourage believers in that area because if we have none of that, then we're really limiting how much God can move in that way because music, worship, it's all powerful, it's all very, very important. 
and it can really impact our lives and influence our lives in a big way. And like I said, because the enemy knows how these things work, he can manipulate sound and the music in a bad way to badly affect people. Moving forward, Matthew 15, verse 8 to 9. We're beginning to build more on this aspect of worship being displayed or being demonstrated in our lives by our acts, by our obedience, by the way that we live our lives, like we read before, whether we eat, drink, or everything we do, we do all for the glory of God. Let's look at the scripture now, Matthew 15, verse 8 to 9. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. We covered over the past few weeks about that this aspect of our heart and our minds can be in disagreement, how there can be a difference between what our we're thinking in our minds of what we're saying and what's going on in our hearts. And we can see that same principle, that same concept here. And the scripture here, the Lord Jesus actually uses it in the context of worship. And how you can be literally, you can be worshipping God, saying, singing these songs, but your heart is not with him. So we can see the same pr principle here, but in the context of worship. And that's like why I mentioned earlier on. Worship is not simply on at church on a Sunday or we put a CD on. It has to be all of our lives because if not, we see this very dynamic here that we're going to read where the Lord Jesus himself says, your worship is in vain. It's meaningless because you, with your lips you're worshipping me, but your heart is not with me. Why? Because the hearts are not in obedience. The hearts are in disagreement with God's word. The hearts are opposed to God's word, but then they're worshipping God with their lips. So let's read this. These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. So we see here what the problem is. Because they're believing, teaching, following rules and things that are man-made instead of God's ways, God's word, God's rules. And he equates that to false worship. That they can be saying, worshipping God, singing psalms all they want with their lips. But the Lord knows the hearts are from far from him and the hearts are not actually in agreement or in obedience to God's word. And that's why it's absolutely vital when we say, I worship God, I'm following God, I'm a follower of Christ. That our lives reflect that. Because as we know, God looks at the heart. Above all else, he looks at our hearts. We can be worshipping God on a Sunday, but our hearts are in a different place. We need to make sure that these things are connected because if not, as the scripture tells us there, the Lord can see our hearts. And what does he say? They worship me in vain. And we do not want to be those who bring false worship before the Lord. And the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, as we know, the, the chief priests, they were the ones that were in constant conflict with Jesus. And what did he say about them? These ones worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. He called them hypocrites. And as we know, many times, these are, these are the labels that people give of Christians. Why do they say that? Because we will hold the Bible, we will say, I follow God. But then they will look at their lives and go, but that does not demonstrate Christ. We're meant to bless those that curse us. We're meant to pray for those who despitefully use us. We're meant to forgive. We're meant to do these things. We're meant to show the love, the kindness. The we're supposed to do those things. When the world does not see those things, they see that as hypocrisy. And I'm sure we've all heard that before. That's the, that's why we hear that term a lot in Christianity, unfortunately, because people can see through that. That's the reality. Unbelievers can see through that. They'll look at a Christian's life and say, there you are holding the Bible. You're going to church, but I don't see Christ in you. And the Bible agrees with that. We've just read it there. Jesus said that you're worshipping me with your words. You're saying these words, but your heart is far from me and you're not following my ways. Jesus said it. If you love me, obey my commands. And this is when we can begin to do what Jesus said, said, let your works come forward. Let the good works come forward. Let people see the good works. And then what happens? Then they praise your father in heaven. When people see our faith demonstrated in our works, when people see the reality of our faith, what the Bible says we're supposed to do and live like, when we do that, then God gets praise. When we don't do that, we hear the exact opposite. You hypocrites, you're meant to be Christians. Look, you're saying all this, but I can see your life doesn't line up. Even I know that's not Christian behavior. I'm sure you've all heard these things before. This is because we need to line up what we're saying, what the Bible's saying, with the reality of what we're living. Then the Bible says, then people will praise God because they'll see the good things that we do. Colossians 3, verse 16 to 7. A wonderful two verses here that connect both aspects, the act of worship and the lifestyle of worship. Really powerful great verses here let the message of Christ dwell among you richly 
as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Those two verses really encapsulate everything about worship. When we talk about the act of worship, the things that we can do and a lifestyle of whether we eat, drink or everything that we do, whether it's words or deeds, it's amazing. But let's look at the first part, verse 16 here. Speaking to one another, teaching one another through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And this really links back to exactly what I said earlier on about the importance of having worship or Christian music as part of what you listen to. Because the Bible says here, singing to God with spiritual songs. If you don't have any spiritual songs that you're listening to or that you have as part of what you listen to, how do you do this? What the Bible says. So the Bible tells us plainly that we should have spiritual songs. So if we don't listen to anything like that, then we don't have that spiritual input that will bless you. We should have the hymns, the songs, the spiritual songs, as it says, the psalms, and singing, making melody in your hearts to God is another translation says as well and when we're doing that those are the acts of worship that keep us in that fellowship that close walk with God and then we look at part verse 17 and whatever you do whether in word or deed do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him so we see here again the scripture telling us whatever we do whether it's word deed we read earlier on whether we eat or drink so the Bible covers all corners here whatever we are doing we do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. We do it all for the glory of God. We make every part of our lives worship unto God. Not only focusing on, like I mentioned earlier, the, the church aspect and then our singular act of worship. It's everything. It becomes everything. When you think about it in the practical terms, morning, afternoon, evening, all of our lives, we begin to say, Lord, I want to focus my life upon you. As I'm waking up in the morning, I want to focus my life on you. Whatever I'm doing today, Lord, guide me, show me. We'll come back to those things towards the end in a moment. We're going to look briefly at the lives of David and Joseph to conclude today. We'll be a little shorter today. First Samuel 17, verse 17. First Samuel 17, verse 17. This is speaking of the life of David. And I want to give us today a very powerful principle that if we put it into practice, it's so simple, but if we put it into practice today, it will begin to change our lives. It's something many people overlook and it's the, the power of giving God the simple and the mundane things of your life. The things that we think are irrelevant and not important. The things that we think, well, God doesn't want that. We don't need to de dedicate that to God. When we begin to do this, the power of this is huge and we're going to see it in the scripture here today. It propels people into destiny because the scripture says, He who is faithful with little, God gives them much. He who is not faithful with little, God will not give them more. And the problem is many times we don't acknowledge or give God the space in the small things in our lives and therefore the big things don't come in. Sometimes we think, okay, I have a big job decision to make or a big family decision to make. And then it's like, okay, God, come into this. The Lord cares about everything. He talks about how he knows the number of hairs on our head. Every little thing matters to God. Everything. He says, do not worry about what you eat or drink. For your father knows these things. Seek first the kingdom of God. Every little thing the Lord covers and he cares about. Now let's look at the life of David here. We're going to look at David and the life of Joseph little parts of their lives here in the final part we're going to look at this today simply because they are two of the most powerfully used people in the whole scripture and yet the moments that shifted their lives into destiny were so simple and so basic that we can easily overlook them but we can apply the same principles that you're going to hear about here today and it can shift your life towards the destiny and the plans that god has for you first samuel 17 17 one day Jesse said to David, Take this basket of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. Jesse telling his son David to take lunch to his brothers. Sounds simple, sounds basic, sounds unimportant. Genesis 37 verse 14. 
This is now Jacob saying to Joseph, sending Joseph on an errand as well. So Jacob said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent them off from the valley of Hebron. Now these two scriptures will probably seem like the most insignificant, overlooked scriptures just about anywhere. We'll think, what is important about that? What What is so big about Jesse sending David to take lunch to his brothers? What's so big about Jacob sending Joseph to go and check on his brothers? This begins to give you an insight into the power of giving God everything in your life. The big the small, the insignificant, the things that we think are even overlooked. David was not told by Jesse. This is an important aspect of these two here. Neither of them were told, this is your prophetic word, David. Now, when you go to where you're going, you're going to encounter Goliath. You're going to deliver Israel. This is the plan. This is what God has for you. That's not what he was told. David did not receive some powerful prophetic word by his father, Jesse, to go and carry out this instruction. Yet by following this simple instruction, doing the mundane things, the basic things of our lives, he is positioned into the vicinity of his destiny simply by taking lunch to his brothers. So we can think about that in our own lives. God may ask us to do simple things. We may be doing basic things in our lives. But when you give everything unto the Lord, that's why it says whether we eat, drink, whether it's word or deed, if we give everything over to the Lord, he can use these tiny, it seems insignificant, irrelevant things to position us for destiny. David was simply sent to take lunch to his brothers. Once he got to that area, he was in the vicinity of his destiny. He then could overhear Goliath's taunts and he recognized. Then his spirit came alive and he recognized, this is what God has prepared me for. When I dealt with in protecting my sheep in the secret against the bear and the lion. This is what God was preparing me for. And see the avenue, see the pathway that God used. Simply sending him on an errand to take lunch for his brothers was enough to bring him into the vicinity. Israel for 40 days and 40 nights had stood in fear while Goliath stood there taunting and mocking. It was not until David came into the vicinity of this issue that Israel were dealing with, of his destiny location. It wasn't until he came into that vicinity that victory came for Israel. And how did it start? By taking lunch to his brothers. To see how we can overlook the irrelevant things in our lives. Once he got to that place, suddenly the divine was activated. Suddenly the promises God would have spoken to him in the secret, the preparation that God had did, all of that came alive simply by going on a walk to take lunch to his brothers. He came into the vicinity that the destiny God had for him. When he heard the taunt, suddenly everything came alive. Before that was all preparation. Before that was all in the secret. Before that, it was simple things. Remember the way his brothers spoke to him, said, go back and look after the sheep. What are you doing here? They just mocked him. They thought, what is this guy doing here? That's the type of thing that we can encounter in our lives, the type of opposition, even when we get into the vicinity. But David was so focused. Once he got to the vicinity of his destiny, all of a sudden, everything came alive in him. And that was because he followed the simple instruction. David was someone who dedicated everything to God in the secret. This is the best example probably in the scripture of who is faithful with little is given much. There he was. He took it seriously when that bear and the lion came to attack the sheep. He took that seriously. He recognized, no, I'm going to look after the sheep. And God was preparing his heart, as the scripture says, God has prepared a man after his own heart. God was preparing his heart in the secret, doing the small, doing the basic, looking after the sheep, it, treating it so important in his life, like his life depends on it. I will protect these sheep. It doesn't matter what animal. So while he's doing all that in the secret, God is taking notes. The Bible said God has a book of remembrance. God is taking notes. Wow, this is one. That I can trust in a big way. Look at the way he's taking his assignment seriously. Okay, Jesse, send them into the vicinity. Then by going on a simple walk, taking lunch to his brothers, he's brought into that vicinity, into the place of his destiny. Suddenly, when he hears those taunts, everything God had done in the secret 
now comes to the open. Everything that had been prepared had now became a time when it was going to be delivered on a national scale from being that little shepherd boy that no one knew what was happening, no one asked him any questions, no one was interested in him. But because he was faithful, as we said, in the little, in the small, in the secret, God had prepared his heart to rule the whole of Israel. He was to become the king, as we know. And all that started in the secret, the simple things, obeying and honouring God in the simple things. It all started there. We now look at the life of Joseph. Genesis thirty-seven fourteen. we just read that. He was sent to simply go and check on his brothers and check on the flocks again. Very simple, basic task instruction. In our own lives, there can be very simple, basic things that we're doing in our own lives. And we may think it's irrelevant. It's not important. God is not interested in this. He is interested in every single detail of our lives. I say to people many times, give God your daydreams. Just submit them to him. It may seem a small thing. But that becomes a huge thing because as you're going about your day, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit will speak something. Something you've been so concerned and worried about it could have been for years. But because you've given him your daydreams, instead of allowing your daydreams to be full of worry and panic and fear and the enemy's lies, you give him your daydreams, all of a sudden your daydreams have been full of the Word of God. Suddenly you're hearing the voice of God clearer just because you gave him your daydreams. The first moment that you wake up, you just say to the Lord, I just give you that. Before I even get out of bed, before I think anything, Lord, the first one minute, five minutes, it, can, it doesn't have to be one hour before you get up. You say, Lord, I dedicate this to you. I now give you, before I even get out of bed, Lord, I'm just going to start the day with, Lord, I praise you. I thank you. Lord, guide me this day. Speak to me this day. That's one of the most powerful things believers can do. It seems, again, it seems so simple. These things seem simple, but they are profound and they will change your life if, we, if you do it. The problem is we don't do these things as believers or we start and then we stop. If you put these things in place in your life, they will change your life forever. It will go from night to day because you start the day with God like that. Watch the way the day changes. The problem many times is we end the day with the Lord and it's full of the worries and the panics and all the things that's happened throughout the day. When if we started the day with him, even a few minutes, shift the Lord, I thank you for this new day. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Lord, what are you saying from your word? Lord, guide me. All of a sudden, your day that was going one direction, you've allowed the Holy Spirit to renew your mind, prepare your heart, it goes a different direction. You have a better day instead of a terrible day that we're praying and saying, oh God, forgive me, I did this, I shouted at this person, I argued with this person. All the stuff that's happened during the day, if we've just given God that one or two minutes at the start of the day, again, it seems tiny and insignificant, these are life changers. These are life changers. We say to God, on the way to work, Lord, from now on, I give that to you. I will put that worship on. I will praise you. I will, I will hear your voice. All of a sudden, that time becomes your time of encounter with God. You could be doing the dishes, Lord. When I do the dishes, I'm going to put worship on. I'm going to focus on you. And may seem tiny and irrelevant thing again. Before you know it, you're hearing God. You're in tears as you're doing that. He's speaking to you. He's bringing destiny. He's comforting you thinking, wow, I just used to daydream and worry about all this stuff in life. And now I'm encountering God. You could be get tidying your house on your way. You could be going on walks. You could be someone who goes on walks. All of a sudden, you dedicate these walks. Lord, when I go for a walk, Lord, I want to hear your voice. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Holy Spirit, do something. Show me, speak to me through your word. All of a sudden, your walk times become encounter times. Just like, look what happened here with Joseph. He was simply sent on an errand. Notice that with both of them. They were simply sent on errands. Irrelevant, unimportant, insignificant things we would think. Look what happens. God cares about those things. He cares about the tiny little things of our lives. The, the number of hairs on our head. He cares about every aspect of our lives. When we begin to consciously, actively, consistently. The Bible says those who diligently seek him, when we consistently do these things, all of a sudden God begins to position us in our destiny. All of a sudden we're hearing his voice clearer than ever before. All of a sudden as we worship in his presence begins to go even deeper than before. Why? Because we've simply committed the little small things to, th to him that we thought were irrelevant. God cares about all of these things. Joseph was sent by his father to simply check on his brothers. Okay, it may seem like initially that wasn't the best experience, being betrayed by his brothers and thrown into the well. It may seem bad, but as I mentioned before, that was him being taken to the position of his destiny. Joseph himself understood it in the end. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. 
And that started with Joseph going on a very simple errand task sent by his father. He went into that vicinity. Yes, that initial experience was bad. It was a negative thing, sold into slavery. But that took him into the location of his destiny. As we know, he then began to rule Egypt in the fullness of time. So just want to encourage every one of us. Give God the little things in your life. We all have different lives. We all have different hobbies, plans, activities, you know, routines throughout the day. Ask the Holy Spirit. Ask the Lord, Lord, what part of my life do you want to me to dedicate to you in a deeper way? What part of my life is not worship to you? What part of my life am I just going through the motions and just doing my normal thing and haven't even allowed my mind to give you a thought? Ask him. And watch what happens when you begin to dedicate these small things in your life. All of a sudden, some of these little changes and tweaks you do in your life, they will become life-changing because you've suddenly opened the door for the Spirit of God to come right through your life and make a difference in every area of your life. Just through that one little door of, let's say you decide, okay, that's it, I'm starting the day with prayer. I'm not going to leave my bed until at least one minute, and that's how simple it can be. The Holy Spirit will give you grace next and it could be five, ten minutes. Next thing, you're really hearing his voice. Next thing, you're picking up the word. Before you even leave your bed, you've encountered him. you set up for the day. It could be on the way to work. It could be one minute journey. It could be half an hour in the car, whatever it may be. You say, Holy Spirit, I, I consciously, I give you this. Watch what happens when we dedicate these things. We could be a walker. We could be just walking places. Just commit those little things. The power of the mundane is so huge. And the eyes of the Lord watch so closely. To these things he looks all over the earth and he sees that person who says like the widow's might okay I see the heart of that person yes to others that looks like a tiny irrelevant thing but what did the Lord say she has given more than all of these because she gave everything she had the tiny things matter to God that's what he looks at first he doesn't look at the big things of okay I'm committing my whole life to God and I will do X Y Z no the Lord says okay those little things that they're giving over to me the lord is watching those things closely and when we begin to say yes to the little things and we become faithful with the little that's when god begins to give us the big so just really encourage us today to just begin to just spend that time and say holy spirit we all know our different lives what is it that i can just shift i can just tweak that i can just surrender that bit more to you and watch what begins to happen when you consistently do that you'll begin to hear his voice you'll begin to encounter him in a much deeper and more powerful way than you've ever experienced before. So I just thank you. I'm just going to close us in prayer before one or two more announcements before we close today. Holy Spirit, we just thank you and praise you. Heavenly Father, would you help each and every one of us, Lord, to give you everything in our lives, our daydreams, the start of our days, even the times we may be going on a walk, oh Lord, may be in our home doing the dishes on the way to work. Lord, whatever it may be, your word tells us. Whether we eat, drink, or whatever we do, whether it's word or deed, our lives are to be living sacrifices, everything in our lives. Holy Spirit, help each and every one of us. Give us a consciousness of this, that we can shift today to a deeper place of walk with you by giving you those small things, Lord. Starting with the small things, Holy Spirit, and I thank you that you will walk with each and every one of us to take us to the bigger things. You have bigger and better things for our lives, Lord, but you require us to be faithful and steward the little first before we can be trusted with the greater. So, Holy Spirit, that you would help us, guide us every day of our lives to give you the little things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank the Lord for his presence that's been with us today. I hope you've been blessed and encouraged. Next week we'll begin to look at acts of worship because they're very powerful and very important as well. We've been looking at worship in general today and how it's part of everything we do. But next week we're going to look at some acts of worship in the Bible and the power of it. The power of what worship can do in and through our lives and just encourage us to develop more and more of a lifestyle of worship that brings that obedience in through our lives as well as normal if anyone needs prayer anyone has any questions anything you want to share with us we're happy to hear from you thanks again for joining us today have a blessed day and have a blessed week and hope we can connect with you next week god bless